Today is hopefully the last time I will ever have to talk or think about Lee Strobel's The Case for Christ. If you haven't seen the other two videos, or if you don't know who he is, Lee Strobel is a Christian evangelist who says he used to be an atheist. He says he works in a lawyerly way to determine the truth of Christianity. He lays out a case for Christ in a book of the same name. He did a number of speeches on it, and there was a movie about it. We're going to be watching the last part of one of the speeches he gave. But before we do that, I wanted to get to something else. You see, I don't mean to brag, but I've seen Better Call Saul, so I understand a thing or two about how the law works, and half my family are lawyers. So I wanted to explain how the legal system works, and what exactly Lee Strobel is arguing here. If Lee Strobel is making the case for Christ, he would represent, in a court of law in America, the prosecutor. He is trying to make an affirmative case that's rock solid and leads people to the conclusion he wants them to come to, which is that not only was Jesus a real person, but he rose from the grave as our savior. I would be playing a defense attorney, I suppose, to skepticism or atheism more broadly, and my role is very different. You see, in American courts, you have a jury of your peers, which essentially ends up making the judgment after hearing the cases. Lee Strobel, as a prosecutor, has to prove, beyond any reasonable doubt, that his case is correct, that Jesus rose from the dead. As a defense lawyer, I only have to make the jury doubt that that is the case. And I have done my very best to make it so. I have laid out a good reasons, a number of them, why I think Lee Strobel's arguments don't hold up. For one thing, his argument seems to rest largely on the issue of the empty tomb. Now, we don't know for sure that Jesus was ever actually in an empty tomb, but I think it's fair to say that he may have been, or probably was. Now, what happened there exactly is what this all hinges on. Did Jesus, in fact, rise from the dead? Well, I would say no, and the reason I would say no is because people don't do that as far as we know, not after three days of actually being dead. But Lee Strobel would say that Christ is God, therefore he can do what he wants, which, hey, fair enough. But which one do you think is more likely? That somebody stole the body, or that there never was a body, or that somebody literally rose from the grave? I know which one I think is more likely. So, as I said, I've done two other videos on this subject where I've tried to make my own defense against the case for Christ, and I think it has gone pretty well. Check those out if you want, if you haven't seen them yet. And now we will get to the rest of this video, which I suspect, since he's over the main arguments, is just about, I guess, why you all need Jesus. So we may not stick with it for very long, but I did want to do this video as kind of a summary to the whole thing. Realize, you know, at some point, Every juror needs to reach a verdict. And I thought, you know what, the evidence is in. I'm not, after two years, I don't think I'm going to find some news flash, something I missed. So I said, i got to reach a verdict. So I sat down with all the evidence I'd encountered over this two years, massive volumes of material, and I'm, I'm kind of sorting through it. And then wait, I stopped, and I go, wait a second. And I kind of stepped back and said, you know, in light of the avalanche of evidence that points so powerfully toward the truth of Christianity, I realize it would take more faith to maintain my atheism than to become a Christian. Okay, that's not how it works, but I understand why he's saying that. It obviously plays very well with the crowd. These people like to talk about how important faith is, but in the end, they do like to denigrate it as something everybody has. And atheists, of course, they'll say have the most faith, as if, again, faith is a bad thing, which they don't think it is, as far as I'm aware. But let's talk about something else that I want to point out here. He says he has massive volumes of evidence for Jesus existing and being the Son of God, which, okay, sure, whatever. Uh, I guess he found it compelling. G good for him. But I don't think just having massive evidence that something existed, that somebody existed, that they did certain things is really evidence to support all the conclusions that are made within the body of said evidence. We can have evidence that Jesus existed, but we cannot really have evidence that Jesus rose from the dead, and if we could, he would not need to have faith in the first place. This is a very important thing to remember, in my opinion. And I must also note, in fairness, that this is going to shock some of you, but at the same time, I don't think he was unreasonable for making such a conclusion if he really felt he had that much massive evidence. Obviously, I disagree very strongly with the idea that he did, 
But I think he maybe should have looked at some of the evidence the other way, the evidence to be skeptical, the reasons to be skeptical about these things. I suspect he did not make too deep of a dive into that particular subject matter, because I've read the book, and he doesn't really discuss going into any of the arguments against the faith, only arguments for it. And that's not really a very balanced way to do things. You know, my mom recently went to the Ark Encounter run by the Creation Museum. I've been to the Creation Museum and the Ark Encounter. I went to the Creation Museum right after it opened with an atheist group, and I went to the Ark Encounter on my own just because I wanted to see it and just be like, wow, there's not a chance. And that's exactly how I felt once I was there. But I digress. Now, my mom, when I talked to her about the Creation Museum, she said, well, the evidence they have seems very compelling, and I would say it does. I would say, if you don't actually know anything about science, or the science they're talking about and trying to take down, it probably does look very compelling. They're reasonable arguments, if you don't know what you're talking about. If you don't know what they're commenting on, it must look reasonable. You have no basis for understanding why it's not reasonable. Likewise with Lee Strobel. He seems to assume that because he was already an atheist, he had all the evidence he needed for that. He didn't need to look into any more of it. He was wrong. He does not seem to have been a deeply thinking atheist. He just frankly seems to have been something of a narcissist who thought very highly of himself. Now that those points are aside, let's proceed. I mean, that was my conclusion. It, it was like the scales just tipped like this. And I realized, based on the historical data, I was convinced Jesus not only claimed to be the Son of God, he backed up that claim by returning from the dead. If he did return from the dead, that would indeed be some pretty groundbreaking evidence for the claim. But at the same time, I'm not really so sure he even claimed to be the Son of God, actually. Uh, Bart Ehrman, a biblical scholar, has cast doubt on the notion that Jesus ever really claimed to be the Son of God in the same sense that these people think that he claimed to be the Son of God. Now, of course... Christians, Christian apologists, Christian theologians would say he did claim that, and he did mean it in a certain way. But I'm not so sure. So you can even draw some doubt there. But again, I don't think Lee Strobel has ever really done the research on this particular subject this deeply. And then you know how I felt? I kind of felt let down. I, I did. I, I thought, it's been two years. Shouldn't, a, shouldn't an, an angel appear about now? I mean, that would be cool. Something, an earthquake would be great. Something... Oh, Lee, the angels were the friends we made along the way. Dramatic? It was kind of let down after two You were the angel, Lee. All along, it was you. Two years, is that it? Is that it? But then I read a verse. John 1, 12. It says, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. And I realized, okay, believing the evidence concluding, reaching the verdict that Jesus claimed to be the Son of God, backed it up by returning from the dead. That's great. That's important. It's not enough. It's not enough. Believe plus receive. I had to receive. Receive what? Receive this free gift of forgiveness. Okay, so now he's into like the overt preachy part of things. Normally I wouldn't sit through this kind of nonsense. Let's be honest, it's nonsense. But I wouldn't sit through it normally. But I think if you haven't really been to a church before, let's say you're a, an atheist or a non-believer who's never had the church experience, you've never experienced anything like this. You may not have even seen anything like this. So I think for documentarian purposes, it's something we should probably watch. But I will note here that Christians have a very interesting uh, interpretation of the things Jesus said. I mean, Jesus straight up said that he did not come for the Gentiles. Uh, over and over he said that, actually, that he did not come for the Gentiles. Now, later authors uh, did add in things suggesting that Jesus eventually came around to the perspective. But no, he never, while he was alive at least, said he was there for the Gentiles, as far as we know from the sources we have. But yet, here we go. Forgiveness and eternal life that Jesus purchased for me on the cross when he died as my substitute to pay for all of my sin. And that sounds like a fantastic story until you start thinking about it. And it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, Dan Barker has an excellent story. Let's, let's actually cut to this Dan Barker story, drawing a comparison. So maybe if there are any Christians watching this, you can see how the whole Jesus story sounds to us. Suppose you were walking by my house one day. You've been walking by for a long time. And I were to go up on the porch and say, hey, stop, I've got some good news. 
Good news for you people. Stop, stop, stop. You don't have to go down in my basement. <laughs> this is great news. You've been walking by all this time. You've been ignoring me, and I deserve to be recognized and honored. And you've been ignoring me, and it's made me so angry and so mad, and I just get so horribly mad, so I built this torture chamber down in the basement. <laughs> And there's some hooks down there, and there's some sharp things, and there's some vats of sneaky stuff, and there's a furnace, and there's some chains, and it's horrible, and there's flames. But you don't have to go down there. I sent my son down there. <laughs> and... And... It was gruesome. I tell you, it was really horrible. But that satisfied my anger. And now <laughs> his blood was shed. And now, I'm, now, now, you, now you're free. You don't have to go down. All you have to do, come on up here. Just come up and tell my son that you love him and hug him. And then you can move in with us. We'll live up in the attic. And you can, you can tell me how great I am. Uh, you, can, you, can, you, can just tell, you can just tell me how much you love me. And we'll do that. Won't that be great? So would you keep walking? Dan Barker, it should be noted, has the exact opposite of the Lee Strobel story. He started out a preacher, a fundamentalist evangelical, the kind of guy you wouldn't want to be next to on a bus, because if you were, you were about to hear the word of the Lord. But he was also a very intelligent and skeptical man, and eventually his skepticism won out as he realized the evidence was not there to support these incredible conclusions about Christ and who he was. Now, Dan Barker, an atheist half of his life, runs the Freedom From Religion Foundation with his wife, and they do fantastic work. I can't remember his wife's name right now, because she doesn't seem to have as public of a platform as he has had, but no disrespect for her is intended. She is awesome as well. And when I would receive this free gift of his grace, then I would become a child of God. And so I got on my knees, and I poured out a confession of a lifetime of immorality that would absolutely curl your hair. As I pointed out in previous videos, he does have what seems to be a really dark story, and he probably needed a lot of therapy. But I am glad religion worked for him. Genuinely, I mean it. If religion made him a better person, that's great. I'm happy for him, and I'm glad it worked. But he could have used some therapy. And just for the record, religion does not solve all of your problems. Certainly, some people become better with it, but some people also become much worse with it. It's really a coin toss which one it will be. And of course, there are good atheists and good Christians, and really, it's about what kind of person you want to be. The average atheist I've known has been a good person. The average Christian I've known has been a good person. It turns out most people are generally decent, good people. And I think we should keep that in mind when we hear these sorts of stories, because yes, I am anti-religion. I am very much against Christianity and everything it stands for. But it does help in some cases, and in those cases, that's fine with me. I don't have that much of a problem with it, aside from believing in irrational things. But if it helped Lee Strobel, good for him. And at that moment, I received complete and total forgiveness through Jesus Christ, and I became a child of God. You know, you could have saved a whole lot of time by just forgiving yourself and deciding to be a better person like the average atheist has to do frequently. But I have known a lot of Christians that unfortunately think they can solve their problems by just giving them to God and thus they deny themselves personal development. Which is very unfortunate, but there's not much I can do about that. I must also note that it is very odd to see this kind of sermon ending, this sort of altar call e sermon but without the music intended to make a person feel things. You know how they do like the sorrowful piano while doing like the come to Jesus sort of moment. It's very odd for me having grown up in churches, experiencing that sort of like ending to the sermon, but without the music. It's just a weird feeling. Maybe they'll start playing it. Let's see. And I remember, I remember Leslie burst into tears and she threw her arms around my neck and she said, you hard-hearted son of a Baptist, I've been telling you this for two years, hello. 
Okay, they are starting to add some music. That's good. Good work, guys. Not letting me down this time. No, I'm kidding. She didn't say that. <laughs> I always wish she'd said that, because that would have been a great story. That, that would have been a great capper if she had done that. But that's not Leslie. She burst into tears. And she threw her arms around my neck, and she said, Oh, honey, I almost gave up on you a thousand times. Okay, you know, this is just like what I'm talking about with the music thing. They do this thing that's like emotional manipulation. They want you to feel things. I mean, let's be honest. Considering the stories we've heard from this guy earlier on about what a, frankly, bad person he used to be, his redemption story is kind of touching in a sense, because it does seem like maybe he did actually change and become a better person through religion. They had reasons to cry and be happy entirely separate from the religious experience, and I think we can all appreciate that in some way or another. But adding in music like this just seems like a cheap trick to me, like, come on, man, the moment is already precious. Let's not ruin it by overselling it. But of course, you know, fundamentalists gonna fundamental. She said, when I was a new Christian, I met some women at church, and I said, I don't have any hope for my husband. He is a hard-headed, hard-hearted legal editor of the Chicago Tribune. He will never bend his knee to Jesus. There he goes talking about how qualified he is to be a skeptic again. I get why he likes doing it. It makes him sound better. And I guess he has a, a great resume, but I'm not that impressed by it myself. And I don't know if anybody else is really, but good for him. I'm glad he had a career he's proud of. And this one elderly saint put her arm around her shoulder and pulled her to the side, and she said, Oh, Leslie, no one is beyond hope. And she gave her a verse from the Old Testament, Ezekiel 36, 26, that says, Moreover, I will give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit within you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And so what I never knew at the time this whole two years that I'm on this investigative journey, what I never knew is that, was that Jesus was looking out for me. But anyway, I think we can end it there. I think we can call it. There wasn't much to this video that we really need to cover. It's just kind of a summary of things. And I don't think anybody really wants to hear his confessional story of, you know, and then Jesus saved me from myself and everything was great and all that. We've gotten plenty of that over the course of these videos and, and, to say it again, I do appreciate that apparently religion made him a better person. That's great. I'm, I'm happy for him. I know I don't probably look it or sound it, but yes, I am. Anything that makes somebody a better person, perfectly fine with me, even if I think it's kind of silly and a silly rationalization and a silly justification. So if we're going to make some kind of summary here, let's, let's try it like this. Lee Strobel acted as a prosecutor in the case for Christ. I acted as defense attorney, just trying to sow some seeds of doubt, because really, all you need to win these kinds of cases is some reasonable doubt. If one person vetoes or stalls the court proceedings in this way by not giving in to the other ones that want to convict, then usually the person is getting away with whatever they're accused of. Now, this is not a court case, so it doesn't really apply. We don't have a real jury. We just have all of you lovely people. I'd assume some of you are Christians, atheists, agnostics, maybe other things, who knows? And I hope that this series has been enlightening. And again, if you haven't seen the other ones, go back and watch those. A lot more information there. But the key to his whole story rests on this. He thinks the empty tomb and the stories around it are what proves Jesus came back from the dead and proved himself God. And he never seems to have done any skeptical research or had skeptical thoughts about this. So if he was an atheist, which I guess I don't want to doubt, I tend to take people for what they say they are, mostly, um, he wasn't very deep in his atheism, he wasn't a deep thinker about it, he was probably just kind of a natural atheist. And indeed, from the way he describes faith, it's not as though he is a super spiritually deep person like, say, Dan Barker would have been when he was a Christian. In fact, Lee Strobel seems more like, again, a, kind of a natural atheist, if anything, that found faith through not being skeptical enough. And that's fine, everybody has their path. I obviously disagree with it, think he could have done better, think he should have just gotten therapy instead, but all in all, sure, whatever, good for him. The key point, though, is 
I think there is definitely a reasonable doubt here that Jesus rose from the dead. And in the end, that's all we need. I don't have to prove that there is no God. I don't have to prove that Jesus didn't rise from the dead. I can never prove those things. It's up to the prosecutor, the Lee Strobels of the world, to prove their case. And in my opinion, really, they've only given us more reasons for skepticism as they have gone on. So I would encourage you to go back and look at those other two videos if you haven't seen them yet, and maybe chime in with what you think. If you have made it to the end of this video, let alone the end of the series, you have the patience of a saint, and I thank you for it. If you like this video, please leave a like. If you have something to say, positive or negative, please leave a comment. I'll probably respond to it. If you like this channel, if you like this video, if you want to see more videos like this, please subscribe and do the aforementioned two things. The algorithms will love you for it, and so will I. And most importantly, I hope you have a fantastic day, or night, or whatever time it is there. I hope you have a fantastic one.